Yes, I am because we are. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone that joined us uh, in today's uh, Pan-African History uh, call. Uh, my name is uh, Dushime Yvonne, and I'm based in Rwanda, Kigali, Rwanda, and I'll be your host for today's meeting. Yes, uh, feel free to introduce yourselves in the comment section. Uh, as our brother Momodu Ba uh, did. Yes, so with this uh, Pan-African History Call, um, we're going to have uh, the country speakers. After the country speakers, we are going to have the Pan-African Healthcare class with uh, Nana Akua. Then after the class with Nana Akua, we are going to have the Pan-African History class with uh, Dr. Tyrone Bright. Yes, so we are going to start with the first uh, speaker. And uh, he's going to help us with a prayer in uh, his uh, local language. Yes, Barry Anthony, can you hear us? Uh, hello. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Can you uh -huh. uh, pray for us? Okay, thank you for giving me the opportunity to pray for us to begin today's um, session. Everlasting Father, we thank you, honor you, praise you, glorify you, your holy name, for the gift of life today. We pray, committing today's meeting into your hands. That Lord may come and stir the affairs of it, and at the end, glory, honor, and adoration shall be given unto your holy name. This and other blessings we seek through Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. Hello. Yes, amen. yes thank you for that wonderful prayer. You can uh, continue with your report. You have uh, two minutes to present it. Okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> um, I send my greetings to um, our founder, co founder, moderators, ambassadors, and members worldwide. Working for the success of this family, may our sacrifices never be in vain. I'm delighted to once again get the opportunity to contribute something small into this meeting. Afrocentricity is a concept that excited, that existed long before it was named and identified by scholars. Afrocentricity utilizes African philosophies, history, and culture as a starting place of interpreting social and psychological phenomenon to create relevant approaches of personal, family, and community healing and societal change. It is important to advance African-centered perspective to reinforce its powerful influence on finding solutions and creating new thinking. This has enlightened us on our history and culture and gives us the vision that if we don't work in unity today, the future will be bleak for our great-grandchildren yet to come. It has given us in-depth knowledge of our cultural practices. With this, we need to work in unity. Worldview should positively reflect traditional African values and culture. African-centered theory is variable, not only understanding the population of Africa, but with others within the history and culture. There must be more discussion and digging to there must be more discussion and digging to further understand how Afrocentricity can be applied to various fields of practice. The time is now and not tomorrow. We must act with all seriousness, and people seeing the efforts we are putting will join us to fight and win this battle in the future yet to come. Thanks for your time. May God be with us all. Report from Derry and Tony, Ghana. I am because we are. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Derry Anthony from Ghana. Thank you for that uh, wonderful report. I am because we are. Yes, up next, we are going to have our, our brother, Momodou Ba from uh, South Sudan. Yes, Momodu, can you hear us? You can uh, unmute yourself.
Yeah, good. Good afternoon to you all. Yes, good afternoon. Hello. Yes, yes, I can hear you. How are you, Dean? Yeah, fine. Yes, okay. I'm My name is Mamuruba from the Gambia. My name is Mamuruba from the Gambia. I'm here to represent my nation and to just give a brief explanation about when we talk about Pan Africanism or Pan Africanism in the Gambia here. Yeah, my, uh, my topic of discussion will be based on the concept people have in terms of seeing white people or seeing other uh, people about from uh, different from black people in the society. In that concept, the, the mindset people have seeing white people in the state is different from seeing we the black people living together. Why I would like to emphasize this because of the concept, the mind uh, we are always having is that the white are disciplined because of the color. Of the uh, of the nature, but in reality, looking at Africa in general, Africa is the founder or is the ground of woman creator. So I believe we as Pan Africa have a very good role to play in terms of uh, removing those concepts people are having talking, uh, concerning about Pan Africanism. The concept we are having. I will say even the, we Pan-African, we sometimes we call ourselves Pan-African, but the question is, are we really Pan-Africanism? Because when we believe, when we talk about Pan-African, it's talking about, let us, what we are speaking, let us do it in action, let us speak, let the action reflect on what we are speaking. But nowadays, Pan-African issues, we, we only based on discussing issues, but in terms of reality, it's a problem. In the Gambia where I'm living, definitely, in terms of rural governance, is we have a big problem in that. The prices are increasing, but anytime you consult the government, they will tell you that the prices are increasing because it's Russia and the nuclear war. Yes. They will always put them. And this is a question. Yes, 30 seconds. Okay, I will conclude, please. Huh? Okay. This is a question I always ask myself. I, I, I always ask Africans. I will continue blaming the Russian war because of that. No. So I believe it is time for Africans to take what rightly belongs to them. Africa is meant for Africans. Thank you all. I love you, Black people. Mamoruba, no nas ba this place. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mamoru. Ba from uh, South Sudan. I am because we are. Thank you for that wonderful report. Yes, up next we are going to have our sister, Neka Ugona. Uh, from uh, Nigeria, hope I just pronounced your your name well. Yes, uh, Neka, you can uh, unmute yourself. Hello, everybody. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Welcome. Hello. Yes, you're welcome. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Yes, good evening. You have to good evening, everybody. your report. Okay. I am because we are. So I am Mecca from Nigeria, and I want to talk about Nigeria. Nigeria is a country located on the western coast of Africa. Nigeria has a diverse geography with climates ranging from Ramid to humid Equatoria. However, Nigeria most diverse nature is its people. Hundreds of languages are spoken in the country, including the Yorubas, the Fulanese, the Aousas, the Edos, the Ibibio, the Tif, and English. The country has abundant natural resources, notably large deposits of petroleum and natural gas. Our head of states, we, um, we have head of states that's governors and presidents. President of Nigeria is Bola Tinubu, and our capital is in Abuja. Population of Nigeria since 2023 is at 202,486,000. Form of government is Federal Republic with two legislative, Senate 109 seats, and House of Representatives. 360 seats. His official language is English. The national capital in Abuja 
is the federal territory which was created by decree in 1976. Lagos is the former capital, retains its standing as the country's leading commercial and industrial city. Modern Nigeria dates from 1914, when the British protectorates of Northern and Southern Nigerians were joined. The country became independent on October 1st, 1960, and in 1963 adopted a Republican constitution, but elected to stay a member of the Commonwealth. Nigeria is bordered to north by Niger, to the east by Chad and Cameroon, to the south by the Gulf of Guinea, of the Atlantic Ocean, and to the west by Bene. Nigeria is not only large in this area, larger than the US states of Texas, but also yeah. Africa's yeah. most populous yeah. country. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You have 30 seconds to uh, finish your report. Okay. So, um, Afro Afrophobia in states known in Nigeria is mostly common in the northern Nigeria, which are mostly um, Islamic and the western states. So, this is um, all about Nigeria. I am because we are. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Sister Neka from Nigeria. I am because you are. Thank you for sharing uh, with us uh, insight about uh, Nigeria. Yes, up next, we're going to have our, our brother, uh, Koma. Yes, Samuka uh, Koma. Can you hear us? You can uh, unmute yourself. Yes, uh, Samuka. You can uh, unmute yourself. Okay, I think they're having some uh, issue with the network. We are going to continue with uh, Morisek uh, Joseph from uh, South Sudan. Yes, Joseph, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my report is basically going to be about South Sudan. Uh, South Sudan, as you know, is the youngest East African country that borders Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Central African Republic. It seceded from Sudan after fighting two civil wars that lasted close to half a century. So it's a landlocked country that has about 15 million people. The Republic of South Sudan is roughly three times larger than the UK and twice as large as Germany. But 64 tribes inhabit this oil rich, mineral rich land and endowed with vast uh, water resources and fertile land to agriculture. Despite the fact that separation from Sudan was considered as the only means to attain peace uh, and prosperity of all South Sudanese, uh, this independence did not actually deliver the promise. So the country descended into civil war in 2013, just two years after its independence. And now South Sudan still uh, struggles with tribal divisions, land disputes, cattle raiding, and conflicts between its pastoral tribes and also its crop farmers. The country imports roughly 50% of its food and almost all of uh, its consumer goods. And in addition, its economy is highly privatized, resulting in high cost of living characterized by rampant inflation. So, but the good news actually is that there is currently relative peace established through a peace agreement between the ruling party and the former rebels. And uh, our hope is that uh, the 2024 presidential election will uh, finally resolve the remains of peace and bring lasting peace and development. Now, Dr. John Garangi Mabur is considered as the great visionary, one of those leaders of the liberation struggle in South Sudan. And he was praised for championing the independence of South Sudan and also uh, being the father of the country. 
but some of his views suggest that he was not really in support of independence, but was a strong supporter of continental unity. Uh, one of his statements, which he said in his speech, was that let us unite against ethnic, religious, and racial divides to restore personal dignity for role. Let us reject being mere of uh, spectators in life, but to become masters of our own destiny. This was a testimony to his commitment to African unity. Unfortunately, South Sudanese, like many Africans, are still actually such. Yes, uh, 30 seconds left. Okay, thank you. I'll wind up. So we still struggle for peace uh, in the continent, in South Sudan, and Sudan even now is in war. Nobody knows when real peace will return. The African Union, United Nations, Europe, US have been supporting peace, even war at the same time. Yet, in spite of their involvement, there has not been really peace. So in light of all this, it really becomes necessary to ask as Africans to ask very important questions. And one of the questions that I would like to ask to go with as I conclude is to ask why Africans uh, wars take longer like other wars in other parts of the world. And also why is it that the peacekeeping mission seem to fail to find peace in our countries like in DRC? How is it possible that Africans have been able to sustain long wars even if we don't have the money and the military infrastructure to continue this wars. And who is giving Africans money and the guns to fight this wars, you see? And why are the same people who are giving the guns for wars also funding peace talks? These are the questions that we need to ask as Africans. Otherwise, we shall not be able to find peace. And the final question I want to leave with us is, in our search for peace, how can we stop tribes, religious, and ethnicities from being used to divide and turn us against each other? Until we can answer these questions, Africans will continue to be a conquered people. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, our brother uh, uh, Joseph from uh, South Sudan. Yes, thank you for that wonderful report. I am because we are. Up next, we are going to have. Uh, uh, our brother, uh, Shahid Kasim, uh, from Ghana. Yes, Sh Shahid, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, welcome. You have two minutes to present your report. Yeah, good afternoon to you and my fellow African contingents on this uh, platform. Yes, good afternoon. Um, the topic for me today is the importance of Afro uh, African centered perspective history. And before I can do justice to this topic, let us first of all look at what history is. History is a term derived from a Greek word, historia, which means inquiry or investigation. It involves a systematic and investigative process that helps us to understand the past of man. It is a study of past institutions and cultures of the people who live in places. Now, the importance of history, or the importance of African-centered perspective history. Um, history, or African-centered perspective history, um, and culture plays a very important role in the transformation of our society. Mm -hmm. It promotes national unity and harmony. Um, it also offers young people the opportunity to learn through the examples of others and subsequently make such people their role models. The individuals find role models among the illustrious forebearers like Dr. Kwame Nkurma, J.B. Du Bois, Malimu Jilos Kambala Nyerere, and et cetera, et cetera, where they can get to know about their heroic deeds and set their, their minds to aspire towards the achievements of peace they have achieved. And history, or African centered perspective history, um, also have us to discover hidden facts. African history has been proven by researchers like Louis Leakey to be the original home of man, as a homo sapien. And also, young contribution was indigenous to Africa. The state of history will therefore help us discover certain hidden history. African-centered perspective history also helps us to learn lessons from the past and avoid mistakes. To help 
um, nations and individuals to avoid mistakes committed by people in the past. History, therefore, play an important role in the, in the reformation of the human race. It is, however, important that as Africans, we will reclaim ownership over the narration of our own history and revive our cultural identity to strengthen a shared aspiration to achieve African unity. Thank you very much once again for the opportunity. I am because we are. Bye -bye. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Kasim. I am because you are. Thank you for that wonderful report. Yes, up next, we are going to have uh, our brother, Samuka Kroma from Sierra Leone. Samuka, can you hear us? You can unmute yourself. Uh, hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, you can hear me. Yes, you can. Sometimes the man speaking from Labrador. I'll be maybe starting the topic of. The topic of culture. I'll be speaking in this argument on the importance of African central prosperity, history, and culture. People will recognize that culture is part of the dream to the people every behavior. Our value sharing history and experience, the language, all affecting how we see things, how we see, and what matters to us. Most important culture is motivated in affecting our thoughts. So in Labrador now, the economic system are very bad based on the activities and, and education status in Labrador is very difficult. Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So now the country is going to run their election by 2020. It is in Vermont, but now the power of country is to have good leaders. Because now the economic stability in our country is very bad. Especially to the education center in Labrador right now is very difficult. So I would like to pray and leave the Africans to pray that can be better in Africa for us. It may be part of the biggest thing in the hair so far of freedom. In recognizing our value, value, our contribution to the development of society. Seeing all year, the country of the world will also like to speak on the exercise of African Muslim. If those who want to go out to the real world with everything, Africa, really, the black people in general, who is still to deserve to something about us. So I would like to thank the 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 standard of the black people for calling those people you not the black in order to do something good for our country. Hello? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Uh, hello, for... hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, thank you very much uh, for that report. That was uh, our brother, Chroma from uh, Sierra Leone. Yes, up next, we are going to have uh, our brother. Yes, uh, Peter Mwanza. Yes, Peter, can you hear us? You can uh, unmute yourself. Uh, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to honor all the seniors of this uh, group and the one who got this group. It is so and great to us, a feather. Uh, let me introduce myself, uh, Peter Manza from Zambia. 
uh, we are glad and blessed for having this session in, upon my country, Zambia. Uh, further, we as Zambians here, or we as Africans, as I heard the, the sermon of a culture, culture is the most important things which as all the uh, African countries. And I'd like to introduce ourselves through these cultures that we have here in Zambia. As Zambia is a peaceful country. Zambia is a country where everyone, it always, whenever you visit Zambia, it's a place everywhere and everyone enjoys. Uh, we have got resources in Zambia. We have got forces in Zambia. Like for instance, we, got, we have a Victoria Force, Karambo Force, different forces that we have here in Zambia. Uh, what we need is the, the Africa at large to support the people of Zambia and the all entire, all entire cultures. And we are glad that we could be able to learn different cultures from other countries and ask to teach others in out of countries. Is everyone getting there? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Cool. Yes, so it's so glad that if us African were able to have the right to move from country to country to teach different cultures and learn other cultures, it's so glad to us that it's important for Africans and for Zambia itself at large. And the honor is that um, Zambia is a place where everyone knows his culture and teach what he knows. And there's a lot of different mean laws in this country of Zambia. Uh, who would like to introduce our mean laws in, in this country of Zambia? Only if the whole Africa sat down and think about other various countries who are not passing, who, who are not well in their academic. For example, we got, I, I, let me say, we got a lot of countries like who are suffering in terms of hunger and all that. If we can teach ourselves through agriculture and, uh, and everything that we have, I'm sure, I'm sure our countries cannot suffer anymore. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, people Monza. Thank you for that uh, wonderful report. Yes, I am because we are. Up next, we're going to have our sister, Monica. Yes, from uh, Zimbabwe. Yes, Monica, can you hear us? You can unmute yourself. Hello, Monica, can you hear us? Yes, you can unmute yourself. Okay, I think our sister has uh, some uh, network issues. Yes, um, that was our, our speakers for today. We are going to wait for uh, Nana Akua to join and we start the Pan-African uh, history class. Sorry, the Pan-African healthcare class. But if you would like to uh, join our WhatsApp group, I'm going to share the link in the comment section. You can uh, join us through that link. Yes, it's already shared uh, in the comment section. And also we would like to welcome uh, one of uh, the new uh, members, Charis Deli from uh, Ghana. If they want to join our WhatsApp group also, they can uh, click on the link just shared in the comment section. 
Yes. So uh, people who are new uh, on our platform, I would like to uh, talk a bit about uh, I Love Black People. Yes, I Love Black People is a global movement uh, using technology to protect uh, Black people from racism and xenophobia. So we focus on uh, eight essential categories which are important in human activities, like which are important in our daily activities. Um, they are legal, uh, transportation, healthcare, food, finance, accommodation, education and uh, healthcare. Yes, I, I think there are, yeah, there are eight. So if you would like uh, to join us, I already shared a uh, uh, WhatsApp link. You can just uh, join from there. And also we have uh, an app, I Love Black People Safe Places app. You can download it and share safe places for black people. If uh, a place is safe for you, it can be safe for us. So uh, that's... Uh, about our movement. And if you have any other question, you can write in the comment section. I will uh, answer your question. Yes, we are going to continue with the Pan-African Healthcare class with uh, Nana Akua. Yes, welcome Nana Akua. And uh, if you want to receive uh, a shout out from her, you can uh, turn on your camera. She really likes uh, teaching while we, you know, watching this beautiful black faces. Yes, welcome, Nana Akua. Thank you, thank you. Good day, everyone. Hope everyone is well. How you doing, Yvonne? Yes, I'm doing good. How about you? I'm great, thank you. Hey, Candace. Candace, I owe you an email. I think I owe you an email. I'm gonna email you. Um, Peter and Faye, greetings to you all, Ebenezer and uh, Hongo. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Barry and Kruma. I think I, I think I hit everyone. We got 19 people on. Okay. Well, all right. Very well. This is week seven, right? Yes. Very well. So today we are talking about um, detox, cleansing the body. Um, let me see how well I have done with pulling up the information to share. I think I did pretty well. Mm, yes. And let me scroll back up here to the top. Um, so turn this around. So, and I'm going to, if I can get it together by next week, uh, for the next cycle, I'm going to sort of switch up my handouts a bit. Um, and it'll be the same type of information, but I have so many handouts. Um, it's just hard kind of scanning in everything and grouping it together. But I wanna give some different um, information about the same or, or around the same topics, but especially for folk who stay on uh, or continue on each week so that you'll see new information or present it in a different way. But we're gonna talk about cleansing and detoxifying. We're primarily here talking about the body. Um, however, we know that we have to keep everything, uh, all aspects of our being, our existence uh, cleared out and cleansed. Um, so mind, body, and spirit. So while this set of handouts will focus mainly on uh, cleansing and purifying and detoxifying the physical body, know that we also have to put efforts into cleansing our spiritual bodies, uh, our emotional bodies, um, and um, our mental you know, bodies. But let's just start out with sort of what we'll talk about today. We're gonna to talk about the definition of detoxification, different methods in which to cleanse or detox. Um, we'll talk about the paths of elimination, 
And we'll probably get into a couple of the ways to do some internal uh, cleansing. So let's start with a basic definition of detox or cleansing. And usually for these purposes or for most purposes, you can interchange detox and cleansing. But a working definition of detoxification, the process of removing a poisonous or harmful substance from the body or the neutralization or mitigation of its effects, right? So you're either cleansing out whatever harmful substances or if they're there, you're doing things that will mitigate or neutralize the effects of that said toxin or poison or what have you, right? Um, an example of this is activated charcoal. So we know that if you've taken in some sort of poisonous quote unquote or toxic or disagreeable food, we know that activated charcoal is taken to sort of neutralize the effects, right? We are ideally, a if we're able to absorb up those substances and get it removed from the body, great. If not, we at least want to kind of neutralize it so that it causes no harm or no uh, negative impact on the body. Cleansing, a uh, definition of cleansing is the process of making something thoroughly clean or ridding the body of unhealthy, unnecessary substances or cleansing by washing. So, pretty straightforward there, cleansing something away, washing it away, um, water being used as a cleanser to kind of flush the body, to cleanse it uh, through and out the body, right? So we know that with this process, there are going to be some symptoms or side effects. We know that if we have been eating fried foods or drinking coffee or um, eating junk and not solid clean foods and we start to do that or we remove certain foods that our bodies are used to, even if they're bad for you, we may have certain uh, effects of that. We may in fact have a type of withdrawal uh, symptoms from uh, eliminating these foods from the body. Sometimes these are just going to be temporary. You got to get through it, uh, you know, get the body back on track, um, to, you know, and used to more healthy foods, right? Um, so it's a matter of standing the course and saying, oh, okay, <laughs> till my body gets rid of the remnants of these oily, greasy foods, you know, it's going to think it needs that or that it is void of something until the body gets used to being without these oily, greasy foods. Um, and then in some ways, the body will give certain um, symptoms. Uh, I think I've told this story before. I did uh, a retreat. I haven't done one since the pandemic, but for probably 20 years, I've done retreats, annual retreats, um, usually in the mountains. I, I'm in Maryland, so I usually will use uh, West Virginia, there's an area in West Virginia, uh, another state here in the U.S., where they have mountains and they have these rental properties where you can rent out and enjoy nature. And, you know, it's a tourist uh, town, so they have spas and things of that nature. And they're known for these uh, bathhouses where the mineral rich waters, people go in, they soak and do that type of cleansing or purging or detoxification. So at these retreats, I always restrict what we eat. And uh, I cook the food, we do juicing, we do uh, primarily vegetarian food, but some pescatarian, some fish, you know, seafood um, dishes. But there was uh, some years ago, a uh, participant who was used to uh, McDonald's most days of her life and drinking coffee. And me, someone who's never drank coffee and never had any sort of addiction, so to speak, to where I have to have something every day. Um, honestly, it didn't even occur to me to have, oh, some people may want coffee, let me have coffee. It wasn't that kind of retreat, right? Uh, the idea was to do fresh juices and water and clean, healthy foods. Um, but she got a headache and kept a headache the entire uh, weekend uh, until uh, and I usually provide transportation, but there was someone who had come from New Jersey or somewhere else and she had her own car. So I think 
that Saturday night, she ended up offering to take the lady to go get something to eat of her choice. And so she chose burger and fries. And uh, voila, her headache was gone, which, okay. She made it a little more pleasant for the rest of us. However, of course it defeated the purpose because we weren't there for burgers and fries. But just know that there are symptoms or side effects when you are cleansing the body. And it's a matter of um, having on hand natural pain relieving herbs to uh, address those symptoms or have in place something to do. And so of course I learned from that, right? So I learned to warn people what we will have and what we will not have. <laughs> and if it was something that you just had to have, bring it with you. Uh, and I always then from there on out kept on hand certain things. Um, and even though we, we tried, but she still just wanted the food, but have on hand, you know, uh, ways to ease people's symptoms or side effects from these things. So the same will be true for you. Even if you are in your home and you're doing some type of cleansing or detoxification, be prepared for any of these side effects, body aches, headaches, body odor, bad breath, weakness, purging, skin rashes, fatigue, these are all common symptoms of doing a cleanse or a detox. So it may be a matter of incorporating a uh, bath with maybe some Epsom salts or essential oils to ease any kind of body aches that you may have. It may be incorporating some type of sedative or Nervine tea that can help with any kind of pains that you have in terms of headaches or uh, fatigue, things of that nature, having natural herbal stimulants, if you would be likely prone to fatigue or be prepared to simply rest. It would not be a time where you would continue your routine of uh, walking three miles every day or jogging or doing your step aerobics or your Zumba or whatever type of strenuous workout. It would be a time to rest your body while you are cleansing it. So all of this takes preparation. So I know I gave a couple of stories that hopefully you understood my point. My point is these things are very important, but with it, you have to do some preparation. And so the purpose of sharing this information is so that you know, not to just stop, okay, I'm gonna cut out eating this or drinking this or what have you, and then just think everything will be um, as normal. It will be fine, but it just may be a little different than what you are used to. We know that some of the ways that we may in fact cleanse are of course using herbs or homeopathic remedies, natural remedies to assist in the cleansing. We may do it through our diet where we do different detox diets. We may in fact need to um, do an elimination diet where we're simply, as I mentioned, uh, what we do with the retreat where we eliminate certain types of foods and drinks. Uh, some people will do raw food diets. Some people will just, just do juicing. Um, some people will do fasting where uh, you're just doing a uh, juice fast. Um, some people will do say a master cleanse where they're doing water, chlorophyll, uh, cayenne, and I don't really use the maple syrup, but if you choose, um, but I use agave nectar where you just do that uh, combination in your water and you drink that for one to three days. Some people will choose to do uh, a detox body or detox foot bath on a regular basis. So if you're doing a week worth of detox baths every night or every morning, um, some people will do different types of massage. In this regard, something like, well, even a Swedish type of massage where they're just doing sort of soothing effleurage uh, types of um, relaxation massages, but this, uh, would be good for your deep tissue massages or your Tai Chi massages where they're, uh, or your acupressure or lymphatic drainage massages where they're actually moving the energy around in the body and getting rid of any kind of stagnant energy that's kind of programmed and set into the muscle. Um, so there are different types of massages that can be used to cleanse or detox the body. And then of course, skin brushing might be a good option or is a good option. This is also great for the lymphatic system. So this is kind of allowing the body to um, get rid of 
the obvious, any dead, dry skin cells um, from the body, but also it stimulates the lymphatic system, which we know is connected to our immune system and our ability to fight off infection. So skin brushing is very important for keeping the skin clean and, and detoxed. So let's talk about the passive elimination. So we know that there are these five organs that are responsible for filtering out and cleansing different parts of the body or different substances from the body. So the five paths of elimination are the kidneys, the liver, the colon, the skin, and the lungs. And we know that there are different ways in which to cleanse each of these. So let's talk about the liver. So we know that the liver is responsible for filtering the blood in the body, right? We know that uh, this is what kind of helps uh, or what filters out, uh, whether it's foods, drugs, uh, any other toxins that get into the body, into the bloodstream, the liver um, is the filtering organ for that. And we know that it takes a great hit, but we also know that it's a very resilient um, organ, uh, can take a lot, can withstand a lot, it comes in contact with environmental pollutants, um, as well as uh, other foods and medications that we put into the body, and it can cause damage. And so these are uh, groupings, uh, both of these handouts side by side, some uh, I think there, yeah, there's some repeats, but these are some good foods and herbs that are uh, excellent at cleansing the liver. Grapefruit, beets, carrots, green tea, apples, cabbage, walnuts, arugula, lemons and limes, broccoli, cauliflower, avocado, spinach, garlic, and turmeric. Um, I think cilantro, I think is the only thing that's not listed here on this other side. Um, so we know that cilantro will add to this list as well. And so all of these foods will do great for cleansing the liver. If we wanted to add additional herbs here, we know that we would add milk thistle or burdock root or um, yellow dock. Uh, and I'm sure there's others that's not coming to mind at this moment, but these are uh, foods and herbs that are excellent for cleansing the liver. This handout gives you sort of a three-day liver cleanse example to follow. It's pretty much uh, waking with, and this handout, and that's another thing I'll need to do is, um, oh goodness, is trying to get a better copy of this or a similar uh, plan. But it's basically starting with uh, water, um, having a breakfast of, Lord, you know, and I can't see none of this. Um, and I'm not going to go sif, uh, shuffling through my hand out to find it. But it's primarily um, fruits, vegetables, uh, your whole grains, maybe a hot cereal, um, but mainly water, lemons, limes uh, in your water, your fresh fruits and vegetables, and then adding in those foods that they consider to be liver friendly uh, foods. So in the previous handout, you know, adding in your walnuts, your turmeric, your avocados, um, things of that nature to assist in cleansing the liver. Also another um, example of a liver cleanse uh, food or drink or juice in this case is, again, we've mentioned the beets, but using the beets as a beet juice where you're adding carrots, lemon, cucumber, and ginger into it. Um, some people will choose to do this liver cleanse juice every day for three days. Um, some will just do this juice along with some herbal tea and water as your juice cleanse for one to three days. 
all of these are good options. And of course, whatever combination that you choose to do. If you don't want to do a juice fast for three days, you know, do uh, fruits and vegetables or solid, you know, fruits and vegetables one or two days and then one day with just the juicing. Uh, all of this is fine. However you choose to kind of put it together is a, is a good idea. Long as you're doing something that's increasing the number of liver uh, cleansing foods and herbs, that's going to be of benefit to you. This is another um, juice drink or uh, liquid drink uh, that you can use. This is also full of foods that are good for the kidneys as well, but celery, cucumber, pineapple, lemon, parsley, ginger, and coconut water. This is going to be good for the liver and kidney detoxification. Um, it will help process all of the substances that circulate through the body, through the blood in the kidneys, and then all of the uh, toxins that need to be flushed out in fluid form through the kidneys. So this will support both of those organs. And we know that turmeric is going to be, oh, let me make this a little smaller again. We know that turmeric is gonna be also good for both the liver and the kidneys as well. Um, so we mainly use turmeric or most people in the world are using uh, turmeric perhaps for its inflammation or anti-inflammatory properties. But yes, know that it's good for the kidneys and the liver. Therefore, it's going to be a good detoxifier. It's going to boost the immune system. It's going to cleanse the blood. It's going to help with coughs, colds, and flu symptoms. It's going to improve circulation in the body. It's going to improve the skin. We know that it's going to do that because it helps with cleansing the liver. And whatever cleanses the liver, cleanses the blood. Whatever cleanses the blood is going to help heal the skin. We also know that it helps prevent internal blood clotting as well. So moving on to the kidneys, some good foods and herbs for kidney uh, detoxification is going to be lemons, celery, cucumber, parsley. If we're adding herbs here, this would be herbs like buchu, uh, uva ursi, juniper berry, um, even uh, watermelons uh, or watermelon seed tea or celery seed tea. Um, all of these are going to be good for cleansing the kidneys. Water, of course, we know is going to be a good cleanser and flusher of the kidneys as well. So incorporating as much water as you can um, in combination with or separate from these foods that are listed here. Moving on to the colon path of elimination. These are some foods that are good for cleansing the colon. The main thing I would like to say with this is we eat solid foods every day. We must eliminate solid waste every day. There is no way around this. Uh, there is no substitute for it. Uh, and if you are taking any sort of uh, supplements, fiber, especially like psyllium seed husk, or even if you're doing some of the commercial uh, uh, types of fiber that's supposed to cleanse the colon, if you're taking these bulking agents and not drinking enough water, and or if you're taking these supplements and you're still not eliminating, you're only making the situation worse because if you're doing these types of things and still not getting uh, a lot of waste moved from your colon through your bowel movements, you're only having all of this waste be reabsorbed into the colon. And so you're going to get impacted. You're still going to have a lot of solid waste that's trapped in the colon. So water is essential here and choosing good colon cleansing herbs in this case. Some of the ones that are listed here, um, not necessarily my top list for uh, colon cleansing, but if I think it's a decent handout that will list foods as well as herbs that are, are good options. Um, so flax seeds, alfalfa, spirulina and wheatgrass, chickweed, cascara sagrada, fennel seeds, aloe vera, peppermint, foods like mango, probiotic yogurts, fermented foods, uh, certain fruits like apples and grapes and things of that nature. These are going to be good colon cleansing herbs. 
uh, if uh, I might would go with um, Cascaro Sagrada is good. Senna is good if you add peppermint or chamomile to it. Sometimes it can be too strong for you. However, if you suffer from kind of chronic constipation and you need something to really stimulate the colon, something like a Senna along with, you know, peppermint or chamomile um, is going to be a good option so that you can move that waste out of your system. Um, but even uh, herbs like slippery elm, turkey rhubarb, uh, burdock, uh, these are going to be good options for uh, natural laxatives as well. Main point here is you have to move this solid waste out of your body every day, at least once a day, but ideally at least twice, if three times a day is, uh, you know, uh, your routine, that's great. Um, I would only say if you're going multiple times a day, I would still just make sure that it's um, soft but solid. So not watery, not runny. Uh, and I think do I have that stool chart here. So yes. So as important as going every day, it's important to take note of the condition or the state in which the stool is, right? So you want your waist to not be these hard, solid pieces. You do not want it either to be entirely liquid with no solid pieces. So you really want it to be somewhere around in here where it is soft blobs, you know, that it easily passes out of your body. Even if it's formed, as long as it's smooth and appears soft, um, these are going to be better options. You just don't want it to have really hard, lumpy, uh, nugget looking pieces that are hard to um, move from the body. And then you don't want it to be all mushy and mostly uh, liquid either. So really keeping track of that is going to be important to your overall health. Now, I don't have a slide in this packet. And again, I'll revamp these packets because we know that there's also the discussion needed for lungs. We know that there are certain herbs uh, that are good for the lungs. Uh, elecampane, osha root, um, mullion, plantain leaves, um, licorice root. There are certain herbs that are good for wild cherry bark, whorehound. Um, these are herbs that are good for cleansing and purifying uh, the lungs. Another great thing for the lungs, and we've done this in class before, and, and, and I don't even think we talked about it last week when we talked about stress relief. So this is a good day to talk about the conscious breathing or the intentional breathing um, and breathing with a purpose, however you want to word it. But we know that the lungs, as with all of these, have voluntary and involuntary actions, right? We can consciously think to do certain things to um, stimulate them or exercise them. Um, and, and we're specifically talking about cleansing them today. But we know that, thank God, we don't have to think about breathing. It's just something that naturally, mechanically, the body does. Uh, but when we do put effort and intention into it, we are able to detoxify and purify the lungs. And so there are a number of breathing exercises that um, can be used uh, to cleanse or purify the lungs. And so um, there's so many, and I've done research for a, a book that I'm working on, and some end up being repeats and they have the same uh, uh, method, but maybe a different name. But I generally still kind of stick with my favorite. I like fire breaths, um, and there's even a couple of different methods in which to do that. But doing some type, even if you are still just sort of a slow, long, deep breathing type of person, that's fine too. It doesn't have to be anything aggressive. So we can simply, you know, inhale at the count of four, hold it at a count of four, exhale at a count of four and take it really nice and easy. Or we can do something like fire breaths where we are actually doing a little more of an aggressive breath of or we may not inhale in the uh, 
uh, nose and breathe out the mouth, we can do all of it in and out of the nose. Whereas right? And I don't know how well that is demonstrated on the camera, but just know there are different breathing methods that we can do. And this is important if we're talking about really exercising our lungs and really pushing out any of the carbon monoxide and toxic gases that we need to remove uh, from our lungs. Doing this every day, especially if you have trouble sleeping, uh, if you, um, whether it's getting to sleep or staying asleep once you get to sleep, um, if you have really stressful days or nights, um, you know, if you are um, often fatigued or you feel like your sleep is never enough, to get the greatest impact and the highest quality of sleep, I think that conscious breathing is very important. So if you don't do anything else. If you don't take any of the herbs that I just mentioned and you just sit uh, once a day and just think about how you're breathing, controlling your breathing. Uh, I, I'll say that in my life, I've been able to withstand a lot of things, including natural childbirth, <laughs> right? Um, by controlling my breathing and really regulating how I feel through my breath. So I think it's a great skill. It can be helpful if someone's getting on your nerves at work or if the children are being a little too much or if your friends or your spouse or whomever in your life is causing some sort of stress or discord. Really controlling your breathing and kind of managing your physical and your emotional state by breathing. Uh, it can be really beneficial to you. And either way, this is going to strengthen your lungs. We also only briefly mentioned the skin uh, when I mentioned skin uh, brushing, but we also know that there are different herbs uh, that will help detox the skin. Uh, so baths with different essential oils that are great for the skin. This might be um, frankincense or lavender or sandalwood or um, turmeric or different essential oils that you can add to baths. Um, this might be some of the salt blends that you might do and take baths with. It may be the skin brushing that I mentioned. And this is natural skin brushing with a um, natural bristle brush, a dry brush that you're dry uh, brushing or brushing your dry skin and you're getting off any dead skin cells, you're stimulating the lymphatic system. This is always done if you're doing any kind of fast or cleansing, this is a definite to add to that regimen. Um, or even if you do it every day, just to keep that stimulation going of your lymphatic system, it increases and improves your circulation in the body as well. But also we know that there are certain um, herbs that are good for the skin, most of which what we mentioned in the liver detox section, where we know that um, any of the blood purifying herbs um, will heal the skin. And these are the same as with the liver, uh, red clover, uh, alfalfa, um, dandelion, burdock, these are going to be really good for cleansing the skin as well. And we also know with the skin, as with all of these elimination um, organs, water is essential. Cutting out your fried greasy foods, your foods with additives, with excess sugars and things like that, all of this is going to have, um, eliminating those foods are gonna have a positive impact on your skin health. Uh, so I think that that, is what I'll mention in terms of um, the elimination organs. We'll talk a little bit next week about some of the chronic conditions that we um, deal with as Black people, um, hypertension, diabetes, things of that nature. I'd also like to mention here that we know our em emotional state also will impact um, our, our overall health. So whether it's skin, like we know that sometimes people will have different breakouts and rashes and blemishes and things like that. And this will be largely because um, of stress. So it'll be because we've not been able to um, handle some sort of emotional trigger, some sort of stress or um, 
imbalance in how we are feeling will have an impact on our skin. We know that that will have an impact on our colon. A lot of times people who are constipated, for example, are usually constipated because they're holding certain emotions in. There's definitely a correlation between um, people who are um, constipated and the people who are depressed or grieving or have certain issues with um, some sort of mental or psychological imbalance. So we know that taking care of our um, uh, emotional self is going to impact these paths of elimination and impact how well our bodies can cleanse and detoxify itself. Um, so I think I will stop there. Let me stop the share and see if there's anything quick. Um, this is a long message, so I'll read that after I log off. Uh, and yes, if you need the handouts, and if you've ever gotten the handout, and usually if you request the handouts, I um, usually try to send all of the ones anyway, for, and it's usually in sets of four, but you know, we handle uh, two sessions per uh, packet, right? So if you've ever gotten them, you know, you have them already. I will, by the next cycle, have a new set of handouts um, and, and just kind of present some same information in a slightly different way, just to kind of switch it up a little bit. Um, but let me see if there were any other questions I can quickly answer. I think these are requesting the handouts. Um, all right, so I think I got that. So, uh, so I am out of time, just in time. Um, so I will talk to you next week and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And as always, I bid you good health and peace. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nana Akua, for this wonderful lecture. And also, people would like uh, to receive the handouts, they can uh, reach out to you via your email. It's already shared in the comment section. Thank you. Uh, have a nice weekend. Yes, we are going to continue with the Pan African uh, history class with uh, Dr. Tyrone Bright. Yes, hello, everyone. Hold on one second, you'll see me in. A few seconds, I'm still adjusting my camera and getting in position. But welcome to the Pan African History and Organizing course. Um, this past week, you actually read uh, Emil Cabral's lecture or speech to African Americans or Black Americans, right? So it was called Connecting the Struggle, a uh, talk between, between Black. Americans. So I want to, I'm going to bring that back up, but I also want to today introduce what I sent earlier, which is uh, Nkrumah. Nkrumah is the necessity for a union government in Africa, which is already in Telegram. And the fifth and first Pan African congresses okay and i'm intentionally saying it slow like that because <laughs> because i don't want you to confuse them for the conference conference right the first conference and the consi the, the consequent congresses are the first and fifth congress that we will look at today hey okay, let me get my camera i'm sorry guys normally i have this camera ready. Anyway, so I want to share my screen so that you can see that it's in there. Uh, but also, well, I want to talk about the history that surrounds the Congresses and why they're important for us to be able to, of course, make a distinction between the first and the fifth. Hello, here I am. <laughs> so, the first Pan-African Congress will take place in year 1919. And this is very important. It goes back to Du Bois and the fact that Du Bois is really in many ways the sole champion um, and sole survivor of the Pan-African Congress.
conference, right? The first Pan-African conference. Du Bois is the sole survivor and he will be the person who uh, champions the cause to the degree that he establishes the Congresses, the first of which is in 1919. And all the participants in the first Pan-African Congress, which you have the resolutions for, and I'm gonna open them up here. Um, by 1919, all the participants of the conference are dead, all but W.E.B. Du Bois. Okay, so let's go back to our first um, first couple of readings. I give you a chapter on Booker T. Washington, Pan Africanism, and Pan Africanists. Don't get caught up on Booker T. Washington. It's really about just the setting and the context that you read about how all of these people are moving around the African world and buzzing about this thing called Pan Africanism that is going to be expressed in a conference in 1900 in London, right? And that would be known as the first Pan-African conference. This is the first time the term is coined and it's coined by Henry Sylvester Williams of the African Association, right? So this is very important because the vision and mission of the conference, the first of its kind would once again, be embodied by none other than W.E.B. Du Bois, okay? All participants, even Booker T. Washington, who is, you know, the, the chapter you read is sort of from his perspective, um, but all of the participants will be dead by 1919, 20 years. That being said, Du Bois would initiate the Congresses and the first and the fifth Congresses are the most important. And the reason for doing Congresses as opposed to uh, another conference, right? Is because the Congresses were continuous. This is a very important point of, and part of knowing and learning about Pan-Africanism because I think that this is something that a lot of people get confused. I've seen people who should know this stuff, teach this stuff, and will still, you know, get this wrong. The conference, first Pan-African conference, and then the Pan-African congresses, okay, which are continuous. So 1900, the conference, the first of its kind, and 1919, the congresses. Right? And the Congresses would be the think tank through which African leadership would basically do what we're doing, develop themselves ideologically around what freedom looked like for them and how they were going to forge um, their way to freedom and liberation on the African continent. So it's really important, um, the first Congress, and then the Fifth Congress, which is also one of the most significant, you saw, you saw the book, well, those of you who haven't seen it, those of you who have seen it, it's already there, the re Congress resolutions. But the Congress resolutions for the Fifth Pan-African Congress definitely look quite different than um, the resolutions for the Fifth Congress. And, and that's important and significant because the Congress has become the setting of this think tank through which African leadership strategize, talk about tactics around liberating themselves in their locales, right? But it also is the space through which further organization that is committed to Pan-Africanism emerges. For example, the organization of African unity and, um, and all its appendages in the sense that, you know, there were certainly different factions within that that um, were advocating for you know uh, liberation but definitely had some factionalism to it and so on and so forth and you'll see that in the essay in the uh yeah in the essay uh written by Nkrumah on the necessity of a union government in Africa. Okay. 
Um, and I also just shared that. So, um, yeah, so let's look at, let me see if I can get it on here. Come off camera. Uh, let me see if I can get, okay, yeah, I can. So I'm going to share my screen and come to our course. Uh, where's my share? Okay. Okay. So this is our course, right? So I already placed, I already placed, uh, our readings for this week in here. And these are the two uh, documents, right? So the Pan-African Congress resolutions and then Nkrumah, Nkrumah, the need for a union government. And we'll start with this. So this is what you're gonna be reading this week. Um, I don't wanna spoil it all, but I'll just, I'll give a little more context um, so the resolutions, as you all know, are basically what is the production of a meeting. Um, and even though these are the Congresses, each, each event is considered a conference, but these are the Congresses in the sense that they are continuous, right? Uh, so this right here is the first Congress's resolutions and resolutions are simply, you know, basically a statement about what what comes out of the conference and uh, the initiatives that will be um, introduced as a result of the con conference, right? That being said, uh, we can see, and I don't want to ruin it for you all, so I'm going to you know, I'm gonna, hold on a second. I'm not going to like delve into all the details of this, right? I want you to read it first. So Manchester, okay, here we go. So here's the Manchester 1945 Congress and the Paris Congress is 1919, right? Now we can see the resolutions are pretty short here for the, that's why I had to go back. I sort of like was befuddled because I never realized how short uh, the 1919 resolutions were in relationship to the 1945. And uh, that makes sense because by 1945, you know, uh, there are very overt statements that African leadership wants to make in every area of life about the necessity for liberation. And it ends there um, with them telling uh, the colonial powers that we will, you know, we're peaceful, but we are going to do whatever we have to do to bring about freedom, right? So I'll just read this last part because I don't want you, I want you all to go through it on your own. Right, I'm just giving you some context. So we also call open the intellectual and professional classes of the colonies to waken to their responsibilities by fighting for trade union rights, the right to form cooperatives, freedom of the press, assembly, demonstration and strike, freedom to print and read the the literature which is necessary for the education of the masses. You will be using the only means by which your liberties will be won and maintained. Today, there is only one road to effective action, the organization of the masses. And that organization, the educated colonials must join. Colonial and subject peoples of the world unite. So you have, um, in this conversation, sort of a demand, right, made at the 1945 Congress. And there's an important thing to understand about this. Shortly after, within the, the next couple of years, you will have a fast move towards independence on the con con continent of Africa. 
It's not as though this is happening and they're saying, hey, we're going to slow down. You know, we're just, we want them to understand we want X, Y, and Z, but we're going to take our time. No, uh, 1962, 1963, 15, less than 20 years later, you have 17 African nations take their independence in two years. Uh, very important. I'm going to post another video that's part of Basil Davidson's uh, documentary called Africa. Uh, and it will show how quickly and in almost like in concert, African nations are taking their freedom, okay, in settler colonies and in, you know, non-settler colonies. So West Africa and of course, East Africa. And East Africa and Southern Africa have a little uh, have a little more of a challenge in the sense that European populations settle on the African continent, right? Kenya, uh, Zimbabwe, back then called Rhodesia, other, you know, uh, so Mozambique, other places, Congo, they certainly did uh, settle in the Congo, uh, the Belgians. So there's a couple of places, and of course, Southern Africa. Um, or more infamously, Southern Africa, South Africa, the, the nation. Um, so that this complicates the, the independent struggles. But that being said, they still have them. You know, 1980, Zimbabwe uh, gets its, uh, you know, pretty much is um, in a position where it gets its independence after fighting. Uh, but then you still have the dynamic of the settler colonial population in these African nations. And so this was very much the turning point historically. You should remember this always, the 1945 Manchester Congress, because of the fact that African nations assert ultimate leader, you know, uh, independence. And there's an aspect of Pan-Africanism that is expressed there, which basically says that we have to unite Okay, we need an independent Africa, not a few independent countries on the African continent. Okay, we need independent Africa from colonial powers. So this is asserted at this historic con Congress uh, in 1945. Now I want to see if I can. Let's see if I can come out of this. Uh, um, all right. Now I want to uh, just open up this document so you guys can see me right here in the course. All right, readings, right? So here's the other reading that you will be um, engaging this week, okay? And it talks about not just the need for a union government in Africa, but it is the speech, the actual speech, as you can see here, that Kwame Nkrumah gave in um, Cairo, the summit in Cairo, right, for the Organization of African Unity. Now, this right here is an organization that is born out of what we just talked about, the Fifth Pan-African Congress. Okay, and that is significant. Um, because this organization, the Organization of African Unity, uh, would go on to be expressed actually even out here in the diaspora, which is fabulous. Uh, the Organization of African American Unity is an offshoot of that organization, this right here, the Organization of African Unity, right? But present day, this organization is still around, but in another form, and it is called, anybody know? What is called? Write in the chat if you know what it's called. I'll go back to it. I'm gonna say it anyway in a second. But um, this organization right here would morph into what we have today, which is called the African Union, okay? And uh, the vision and mission of the Organization of African Unity was always to bring about the unification of the African continent for the purpose of, uh, to for the benefit of uh, African people. And actually many instances, some people may go right to just citing, you know, 
uh, in Krumah's definition of Pan-Africanism, which is the unification, total unification of the African continent um, under scientific socialism, right? And so a lot of people would cite that as the definition of Pan-Africanism and most, you know, a lot of people would agree. Now, not everybody understands what scientific socialism is, and that's that's all another conversation. But um, out of this concept by Nkrumah, particularly, you have the emergence of the Organization of African Unity, famously called the OAU, right? And then you have the AU. Now. I'm going to let you all read this. We'll have a more in-depth discussion about this. I don't want to ruin it because there are some things that I want to just relate this to in a contemporary context because none of this is valid if we don't deal with the, the, the contemporary, contemporary reality um, in terms of uh, what the OAU, what happened to the OAU, what happened to um the original vision and mission what happened right so we need to deal with that we will deal with that next week but only after you read this okay so i'm gonna take us out of here i hope my screen share okay i'm trying to stop the screen share stop share i've moved so you're gonna see me just behind a white a white wall <laughs> all right so um, and that's in essence it. Um, you have those two documents and you can read them and then we'll come back to talk about it. But uh, I think you get the context, right? So now you're getting to see in the fifth and the first Pan-African Congresses, what exactly were we saying? What were, were, what were our demands? Um, with regard to um, the African world and also to uh, the colonial um, regimes, okay, at the time, because the, every African nation that would be part of this is not completely free. Some of them are undergoing, right, that transformation. Uh -huh. They're entering those transformations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but they are not uh, completely liberated. Right, the Organization of African Unity, um, in many ways, is meant to do precisely what we're actually doing, which is engaging in ideological development, developing ourselves in order to um, execute something very specific. Right, so that that's the point of um, sort of the Organization of African Unity. It is. Um, you know, it is a think tank. It is a space where they challenge and affirm each other ideologically and come to the conclusion that total liberation and unification of the African continent is um, a necessity. And we're still struggling for that, right? Have we've never had a totally unified Africa? We are still, there's some of us uh, who really, who are still struggling and fighting in, in big and small ways to bring that about, but that was the vision of the Organization of African Unity, okay? So just let me just say to you that you should keep all your documents because this is a piece of history, okay, that few people have. You generally would have to buy a whole book to get that document or those documents, right? The um, first and fifth Pan-African Conference resolutions, Congress resolutions, right? You're usually gonna have to buy a book. I know it's an African intellectual heritage along with other things and, but you know, keep all your PDFs together so that you can go back and reference them. But Essentially, you know, what was happening in the OAU would be, you know, the ideological development, developing oneself so that there can be harmony between theory and practice, right? So in theory, this is what we want, blah, 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 blah. And in practice, this is how we execute it, right? And there's going to be various strategies and tactics. So this is sort of what is happening in the African Union and understanding that 
um, individual liberation of African countries here, there on the continent would not be enough. Total liberation was the objective and unification would insulate us. So, you know, that that is the guiding thought um, for the OAU and um, expressed in these other um, meetings and bodies, okay? Uh, so read that. I can't wait to see when you guys come back with because I think that people, these older leaders had a positive mind to transforming, transforming Africa, but has the implementation of being successful after they pay the, well, you know, we're still in that struggle, Ebenezer. So I'm looking at your comment. We're still in that struggle. I think we're still in the grips of that struggle, right? Learning, trying to do that. Title of black is black. <laughs> All right, that's an interesting title. I've written a book and you great help. Title of black is black. Okay. Dark and man, I'm going to be acting with this. I'm going to be talking to the world. I'm so excited. I'm going to be talking about this. Are you, Chris Emanuel, are you actually in the course? I give the documents here in the WhatsApp group. I mean, well, in the Telegram group now. Are you in the course? Are you in the actual course? Because once the course is done, then they remove me from whatever that um, setting was, you know, uh, and then I move on to the next course. So you should, the, most of the documents are the same. I change my lectures and update them, hopefully, and add a couple of visuals here and there, but generally um, you, the first time you took the class, you should have uh, gotten all the things that I presented here. Um, admit, um, Yvonne, can you see if, uh, <laughs> sorry guys, can you see my cat? He just, okay, no, no. Uh, My uh, admin, so Yvonne, can you find out if this person, um, Chris Emanuel, is actually in the course officially? Yeah. And why he wouldn't get um, like access to, you know, whatever, or so can you add him to where we are right now so that he could see all the documents up till this point? Um, all right, so let me see. With the religious, ethnic, tribal, and racial divisions in the continent in this division of the United States. Um, so I don't know that it is realistic. Um, I think that my cat is so jealous. Uh, I think that we need to be clear about what we want, right? Um, it's not simply like a United States of Africa, because I think that would be problematic, right? A United States of Africa. I think a un unified Africa. And what does a unified Africa mean to me? To me, a unified Africa is the, an, an African continent that works in the best interest of its people and, and is unified in that, of African people. So right now, what do we have? We have an African continent that uh, other people outside of Africa benefit more from than anybody else. And the people within these, the borders of various African nations and within the borders of, with, within that continent, benefit the least from what Africa has. So to me, a unified Africa, I don't I don't care what one calls it. It doesn't need to be called the United States of Africa or anything, but it needs to be a unified Africa, a Africa that benefits the people more than um, it does uh, Western imperialist nations. So that to me is what a unified Africa is, right? Um, I do think that it's not something that is going to happen 
Um, let me see. I don't have access to the too, so can I get them? Um, Yvonne um, Morestic says they don't have access to the reading materials. Um, yes, they okay. can, can. Can you make it available, like just um, our session, so that the person can see all of the um, readings for this cycle 24. Anyway, Ebenezer, um, it says, if we still, if we still in the struggle, are we on slavery and independence, then what is the missing link? Well, let me just say something. I, there's not a, we're still in the struggle, right? And now, now that we have been dispersed, I don't think everybody wants the same thing, right? Right? We have to say, what do we want? And if, we, if we're going to assume that, oh, okay, we're one people that span the world, everywhere you go, someone may say something quite different, okay? But I will tell you what we must have. We must have protection of our lives, okay? We must have the freedom to walk this earth and be safe everywhere we are. Those are the things we must have. And um, I think those are the things that some of us are both part of. That's what I Love Black People is about, okay? Um, and this is, you know, sort of the ideological training to get you acclimated to thinking that way, that that's our right, that's our human right to move around the world, this earth, freely and safely and free of negation and uh, free of the uh, indignities of racism and xenophobia. Those things are our rights, right? Now, the other stuff, a unified Africa, beautiful. We're working on that but the safety and the freedom are what we must have today not tomorrow or anything like that today uh no you know i get where you're coming from i don't know that there is a missing link i think we i think we're impatient okay and i say that because i know that i'm impatient um hold on let me I'm trying to get the screen back. Um, I know that we're impatient because I'm imp impatient, right? I'm impatient with the fact that this is where we are at this time. And this is when we're living, you know, we're living in a certain particular period and time in history, probably one of the most exciting times in history. That being said, we're still in a... Um, violent struggle, I would say, uh, around the value of our lives in this country and everywhere else on the earth. Um, it's unfortunate. I know it's going to sound funny, but it's unfortunate because that isn't how it always has been for us in the world, Black people, African people. We do have to have a sort of larger context to understand it has only been in the last four to 500 years, and I get it. Uh, most, no human being lives that long, but only in the last four to 500 years that we have been in this condition fighting white supremacy and culture on a, a, a system that has been constructed. Let me say, when Africans into the Iberian Peninsula, they are in the Iberian Peninsula for you know, almost 800 years, seven to 800 years, ruling first the Portuguese and then the Spaniards, occupying that part of the world, bringing, yes, civilization to the world. What I'm saying is, is that they, Europeans, were invaded by Africans in the Iberian Peninsula, present-day Portugal and Spain, uh, West Africans in particular. There is a ruling of that part of the world by Africans for 800 years. 
we have been in the Western Hemisphere and have suffered under colonialism uh, for the last 400 years. That's half the time as the Moorish rule and domination of Spain lasted, half the time. And already in half that time, we have wrestled our way out of enslavement everywhere we are. We've wrestled our way and fought our way out of um, overt, um, the overt abuses of colonialism and imperialism. We've kicked European nations out of our countries and, and taken back political power from them in various places. Although I recognize, if you remember last week's reading and what I'm telling you about Emil Cabral, we still are fighting neocolonialism, right? Which was an upgrade to the systems and, and, and the game, if you will, uh, which is that now you have same exploitative, the same exploitative systems, but the administrators now look like us. Um, but let me be very clear with you. We are kicking butt, it's just that we're kicking butt everywhere we are in the world. We're not going for it, okay? Um, we are not sitting in historical terms, we're doing quite well. And I know that that's a, uh, sounds like what? You know, we see this going on that, no. I'll give you an example in the context of the United States. 250 years of chattel slavery, meaning that you're being property, right? 50 years of freedom, not even that, 12 years of freedom, we're fighting our way out of that. And I think that that tenacity um, and spirit exists for us everywhere we are. Um, if you go back to the uh, YouTube video, the portion of uh, Kwame Nkrumah's speech on the history of Pan-Africanism, he talks about this mass characteristic that we all have. And we are acclimated to engage in a mass way resistance and resist oppression uh, everywhere we are. So this is why, and we inspire each other. We have a dialectical component. So we see some black people, African people over here doing this. We understand we have the same condition here. You get in a response all around the world. So. It's unfortunate for me, for you, for all of us that we're living in a time where we're still engaged in this struggle, but we shouldn't, um, we're fighting, we're fighting. We're not on our knees, we are still fighting and we're getting smarter about it and more sophisticated about how to fight every day. So this course is the history of how we do that individually, organizationally, and then continentally. And the continental unity story is still in the process, right? It's still in the process. Um, and, and to answer your question, no, unity for me does not necessarily mean we're going to be in the name of some Western nation and just do our black version. <laughs> unity for us, for African people from the continent, uh, which is the seed of all of our power, the African continent. Um, you know, what it looks like may vary, but what it provides for us will be consistent, right? And, and what it should provide for us is that, you know, we have a right to live, thrive, be uh, safe and free period, right? And with a solid unified Africa that can advance the interest of African people globally, we can secure some of those things, okay? So, um, but, you know, I'm not pro promoting any uh, United States of Africa. Certainly it's not gonna do us any good, um, but we need a unified Africa. So I was like, Ebenezer, that was like a scenic route to your, to the answer to your question. Yes, we have changed our mindset around us. And um, yeah, we do, we have to, and, and okay, so I was gonna wait and sit on this. Um, 
yes, uh, yes, Chris Emanuel, wonderful. Yes, remove borders. Uh, unidentified communication, telecommunication, unidentified currency. Um, Uh, so, well, I think you meant to write uh, unified telecommunications, unified currency. Yes. Um, industrialization of Africans. Absolutely, because the con the con the constant dilemma for most African nations is the fact that um, is the fact that most African countries has raw goods, raw materials. And that being said, these raw materials are uh, then exported and put in a can box by a factory, an industrial plant, and sent right back to us everywhere we are, right? So, Well, yeah, I mean, this is what colonialism, I'm speaking of Moresic, um, that's what colonialism does, right? It oppresses and exploits. So, you know, what happens, most African nations are producing raw goods, right? And um, those raw goods are being processed by industries, Western industries. And they're exploiting and it's even raping the economies of African countries because they exploit your raw materials. They, uh, they cheapen and they, you know, uh, rob you in terms of the price for raw materials. Uh, but then, and they very often are setting the price for the raw materials coming out of various places. But then once it runs through their factories, uh, Western industry, then it comes right back to you and you pay for it and you pay tax on it. And that's probably something that could grow right below your feet at the same time, right? So these, these are the things that we want to eliminate. We want African people to benefit the most and first from African resources. And we want our communities to be places where we can thrive, not simply extraction sites for the Western world. Uh, Black communities in the Western Hemisphere and African communities on the continent of Africa pretty much have the same plight. Europeans, I mean, if you could just see like a drill, you know, it's like or, or a syringe drawing from the land and from that particular locale or site, whether be it a community or a country. And that's what they're doing. It's an extraction site. And the extraction is of wealth. Of resources, material, and even human and otherwise, and uh, who does it fatten and uh, you know benefit? It benefits Western and Western European, in particular, nations. Okay, all right. So I'm already way over. I'm gonna stop there. Um, when it comes to industry, yes, we need industry. Yeah, so I mean, right, we have to, I think, you know, we have to work together, but also too, I think last week's lecture that I alluded to is that, you know, we also have to be um, astute about our own analysis of things, right? So just because we look alike doesn't mean that we serve and advance the same interests. This is why we need to be able to qualify things, right? And that's sort of what we're gonna be doing with the, the uh, the resolutions qualify each of those when we come back to it next week. But we can have leadership that looks like us, but we've got to be able to qualify what they're doing for us. Otherwise, we should assume they are doing nothing, right? And, and so, 
And, and, and that is the dilemma on the continent of Africa, even out here in the diaspora. We, have, we are in a very serious colonial, neo-colonial state that we just don't really um, have a lot of conversation about. Um, but it's also, of course, on the African continent. We can see African leadership not necessarily serving the interests of African people. Once again, you know, um, we have to identify that when we see that, right? As neo-colonialism, it is a certain stage. European nations, imperialist nations controlling Africa and African people with black faces, right? So Europeans controlling us by utilizing other black people and, um, you know, other black people, period. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna stop there because I actually could go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Put take some of these comments and put them in the group. Um, put them in our Telegram group, twenty four, and because I'd like to keep dialoguing about them, right? And thank you. I see Isaac. I see your comp um, your comment. Uh -huh. Well, you know, that's just thing. That's the thing, Isaac. Isaac, it's like, and, and I'm sorry I'm saying your name twice, but it's like thinking that we should be fighting versus understanding that unity is going to do the fighting for us to a large extent. So a lot of times people think that, you know, our job is to, to, to fight white supremacy and culture. But another way to think about this, um, you're welcome. The other way to think about this is that we've got to fight for unity, right? Amongst ourselves. Once we get the unity that we need and we've got to struggle for it. So we we look at the whole thing sort of um, in a problematic way. Our unity will insulate us from a hostile society. It could make us impenetrable. Uh, the problem is, is that we think that fighting the evidence of colonialism and racism is what we should be doing when in actuality we should be fortifying ourselves and our relationships and so yes let me say this Isaac we will yes we will have fights black people and African people will have fights um but and and we will always have fights why because we're close we're close to each other we're in proximity to each other and we have been since the beginning of time so of course we're going to um, uh, have issues. That being said, the order or who, what takes precedent over the others, meaning now that we have white supremacy and culture, which is something that spans the world, it's expressed as racism. We have to fight that because that is a collective issue. But how we fight that, the strategy in which and the tactics in which we do that is going to be based on, um, you know, the work we do here, how we develop ourselves, right? Okay. I don't know if I made that clear, but I tried. So we'll come back to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. And I'm going to leave it there. Have to speak. Okay. Your microphone is unmuted. Okay. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I don't know what's going on with this thing right here now, but I can't see you all. <laughs> All right, there you go. All right, so I'm getting off and thank you all. Thank you very much. <laughs> so um, some of you had comments that I would like to see us build on. And if you can take those comments, thank you. Um, if you could take those comments and put it in the um, Telegram group, that would be good because I would like us to keep 
dialoguing on this particular issue right now let me just say well should i even say it? yeah i'm gonna say so the organization of african union today is expresses the, uh, the organization of african unity is expressed today as the organization of is expressed as the african union right with its headquarters in Addis Ababa. So one of the things that I want you to be aware of as you read this is that today the African Union um, stands in Addis Ababa. However, 60% of the funding of the African Union whose vision and mission should be aligned with the organization of African unity, right? It's, it's early um, uh, manifestation. Uh, but 60% of the funding of the African Union as of about 2017, 2018, came from the European Union. And I just wanna leave that little tidbit with you. I want you to think about that as you read the documents. Okay. Um, the first Pan-African Congress, the fifth Pan-African Congress, and then Nkrumah's speech in Cairo about the organization of the establishment of the organization of African unity, okay? And then I want you to think about the present day manifestation of the organization of African unity called the African Union. And the fact that 60% of the funding for the African Union comes from the European Union. So I'm gonna leave it there. I'm going, I want us to talk about fulfilling the vision and mission of the African Union. And what does that mean, given what I just told you? Uh, Chris Emanuel, um, Yvonne, can you help him with regard to getting in uh, Telegram? He wants to get in Telegram or he basically wants to revisit his course, revisit this course in the readings, right? Ian, so can you help him? I already him? shared the readings with him. Say it again. I already shared the readings with him. You can oh, share okay. Him. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Joseph, and everyone else who stayed to the end. I don't want to keep going on and on because you know that I could. Anyway, um, have a good weekend. Uh, stay safe. And I am because we are. Yes, thank you very much. I am because. Okay. Yes, bye. Okay, bye bye.